Hello everyone, welcome to the brand new platform for the Tickle Trunk of Horror show. You're here with Timothy and Alexandria. Hello everybody. And yes, this show has been out for a couple of years. However, we decided to give it a different platform, a different channel, its own channel, because we wanted to kind of separate the horror podcast shows from the paranormal actual documentaries and stuff like that that we put out and uh, we do recognize that you may be in the paranormal but you may not actually be into horror or you may be in the horror but not be in the paranormal so we're taking a risk because we had a lot of subscribers on the other channel but we're taking a risk by starting off this uh on this new channel but i think it's worth the risk and i think that if you uh subscribe to this channel uh, hit the like button if you like the show and, and subscribe to the channel. You'll like a lot of the shows that we're going to be have coming out for you. Uh, today's guest will be Dakri Stoker. And Dakri Stoker, as you know, Bram Stoker is royalty, is a legend in the horror world. The author of the uh, hit book Dracula, best selling book Dracula. And uh, for some of you that may, very few of you out there that may not know, Bram Stoker's classic vampire character, Dracula, was named after the 15th century Romanian prince Vlad Dracul III, who earned his place in history by, by impaling his enemies alive. And so... Uh yeah, and I, I actually wrote the book, and I'll show you, if you look at your screen right here, you can buy it on Amazon. It's called Vlad the Christian Warrior, and uh, Vlad III the Cr Christian Warrior, because a lot of people didn't know that he actually received an award for fighting for Christianity, which he was really fighting to avenge his uh, dad's murder and, uh, and everything that's happened to his family, but by default, uh, he was looked at as a Christian hero. And he's still celebrated today in other countries. And uh, Dracula also is literally translated in Gaelic as Dracula, meaning bad blood. And again, Count Dracula is a fictional character in the Dracula novel and again was inspired by one of the best known figures of Romanian history, Vlad Dracula, nickname Vlad Tempest Vlad the Impaler. He was the ruler of Valachia at various times from 1456 to 1462. And so if you want to learn more about Vlad, check out the book. You can buy it on Amazon. But uh, since we are going to have Dakari on the show and we're going to be talking about Dracula and uh, we'd like to talk about some of the uh, good movies this based on uh, Dracula. Of course, you got a movie out called Bram Stoker's Dracula, and I'm kind of curious to ask uh, Dakri what he thinks about that one. Uh, what did you think about it? Well, you know, before we go into that, I just want to touch on a few more things where uh, vampires are believed to hang around crossroads on St. George's Day, which is April 23rd, and the eve of St. Andrew, November 29th. And uh, it's just, I, I didn't really know that about the various superstitions in regards to Romanian folklore for centuries. And uh, it really is uh, something that I didn't know about. Yeah, me either. And, uh, yep. And we, it's funny you say Crossroads because we just, we're watching the, the old shows of Supernatural. We kind of started from season one, episode one. And we all the way up to season two, I don't know, episode nine, ten, somewhere in there. And they just had a show on the crossroads, actually. It didn't have nothing to do with Dracula or anything like that. But uh, I thought it was pretty interesting that, uh, that that comes up in this show, since we just seen that show last night. And there's been various films. There's Dracula Undead that came out in 2014. And there's been comedies where uh there's a hotel transylvania for children as well so there's a lot of variations in regards to vampire movies that are out there and you may have your own favorite again mine is my very favorite is uh, 
Francis Ford Coppola's uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. I really, really liked that. And uh, I found it, uh, that's one of, I think, my favorite uh, movies as well. There also was a, a Dracula 3D uh, that came out as well. So there's been a lot of different movies. Dracula 2000 came out and that was uh, done by the late Wes Craven for all of you Dracula fans out there. So there's been a lot of Dr uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It was sort of a comedy with Leslie Nielsen as well for uh, horror and comedy fans out there. There was Dracula 2070 2007 pardon me which was uh, by a, a BBC Wales as well so there's been so many variations of Dracula movies and I know everybody has their own uh... my favorite Dracula of all time is grandpa from the monsters <laughs> grandpa so yeah that would be my favorite Dracula I know a lot of people a lot of the people that maybe are older than me probably like Bela Lugosi is Dracula he was the uh, one that everybody associates with the early films uh, the early horror films universal films the uh, Wolfman Frankenstein the mummy and uh, of course Bela Lugosi is Dracula Boris Karloff played Frankenstein and Boris Karloff also also played the mummy and uh, yeah and also uh, George Hamilton was in love at first bite so there's been so many variations in regards to uh dracula and vampires out there there also was the house of dracula as well out there that was uh the house of dracula um is uh brings uh, in 1944 frankenstein's monster and the wolfman and dracula uh dracula was played by john karen Carradine in this film got together for a little terror party at frank's in the house of Frankenstein so it's full of murder mayhem and of course there's got to be romance in there as well yeah and so if you uh, if you go back to the I guess late 60s or the 70s and you look at some of the early hammer hammer uh, films hammer horror films I would say that they they put out some damn good films on Dracula uh, some really good ones and so they're really worth going back and, uh, and re-watching. But when you talk about our guest today, he is the uh, great-grand-nephew of Dakari Stoker. What were you going to say? We forgot Nosferatu, the most famous of all. I love watching Nosferatu. And I'll tell you what, if you go to our other channel, we'll put a link to that in the description, World Paranormal Research Society on YouTube. If you go to that channel, uh, Nosferatu, we put it on there for free. You can go on there and watch it. And yeah, uh, that I guess yeah, that would have been the first Dracula film. Yeah. Really, that right. that really was. So Nosferatu again. Uh, because he got the, the people that did that film. A lot of people don't know that uh, Bram's widow uh, sued the uh, company that made Nosferatu, and that's why it kind of went off into obscurity for a little while, because they got sued for ripping off the Book of Dracula. That's what the claim was. Although I think it's uh, it's a bit different if you actually watch the storyline. But yeah, I can see the similarities, of course. But uh, the 1921 classic, again, Nosferatu, is the single oldest Dracula film. And it's among the earliest horror films in general, folks. So Well, no, Frankenstein by Thomas Edison uh, was the very first first horror film ever made. And it was Frankenstein. Well, this was one of the earliest Dracula movies. Yeah, 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 yeah I know. And so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to watch for me because it is the silent film. I mean, you have to be really appreciative of watching film. I used to be, but I'm, my patience is worn down of, as the years go by. So I can't just sit down and, and watch Nosferatu anymore. But I did see it a couple times, and it is on the World Paranormal Research YouTube channel. So uh, we're about to give Dakri a call. So let's do that. Anything you want to say while I'm making a call? No, I, I'm should, I should be good with that. So again, folks, Dakari Stoker is the great-grand-nephew of Bram Stoker. So we're really honored to have Dakari Stoker on our show today. And uh, again, we have a lot of interesting things to discuss, touching again on Bram Stoker, Dracula, and numerous other things as well. 
Dacre. Hey, Dacre, how are you doing? This is Timothy and Alexandria of Tickle Trunk of Horrors. I'm good. How are you? We're doing good, thanks. Yeah, we're doing real good. good. We just gave a little bit of introduction there for you uh, before we made the call here because, uh, like it or not, man, you're a royalty in the horror world. And uh, having a, a great granduncle, Bram Stoker, I don't care. The relatives 200 years from now are still going to be royalty in the world of horror. And uh, that's got to be a great, <laughs> great, great feeling for you. It is. You know, he's well respected. Many people have been inspired by his work. Uh, he's written a classic. Uh, I, I couldn't be more proud. And I'm very happy to take on the role as the guy that helps to protect him and promote him at the same time. And, and you, and you, being the great grand nephew of uh, Bram, you're actually coming into your own right in horror. And I mean, you you wrote the book Dracul, you put it out, and um, and I know that you you and J D Barker did a tour on that. And uh, how did you enjoy the tour? Well, uh, every what every every book tour is a little different. Uh, it involves. A, a ton of planning and uh, sort of organization of, you know, to keep yourself sane because it sounds wonderful as, as you say, oh, it's great to be royalty. But behind the scenes, you know, the, the traveling overseas, the, the movement about the lack of sleep, and then you've got to be like 100% on when you're in front of the press, the media at certain events, giving presentations, book signings. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy it. But it is, uh, it's not always as glamorous as it seems, but it does bring us to some pretty cool places and it puts us in touch with people that are really interested. And so I just, I love just, you know, kind of catching the vibe that your readers have and want to know more about the stuff. And, and that's what makes that solitary confinement for a year or two of research and writing all worth it when you, when you get out there and meet the people on a book tour who are really enjoying what you're doing. And, and, and speaking of that, I know that overseas, they have a different cover for the book than what we had. Which cover do you personally like the best as the author there? Well, uh, that's a good try. You're not going to get me to <laughs> one publisher off the other. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And here's why. No, okay. it's, 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 there's a very good reason for it. Okay. And it just tickles me pink that I see all these different covers. Because what it's telling you is that somebody, in, in, you know, some artist, some graphic artist that works for a publisher or he's a contractor or whatever, he, he reads either the whole story or parts of the story and gets a synopsis. Then it's got to go into his brain and then come out in a way that he's got one shot at, at painting, creating a, an illustration that kind of sums up your story, but at the same time attracts people with cover art either pull this thing off a bookshelf in a bookstore or look at it online and go, ooh, that's going to catch my eye because you guys know very well there's a lot of books out there. And that cover, even though in this case J.D. Barker and I have nothing to do with creating the cover, we're beholden to how good that artist and that marketing and promotional department of our publisher in these foreign countries can read what they're what their readers, what their customers want to buy. And so I look at the British one, which is actually, it's not just UK, they sell different English speaking parts of Europe. It's got that really cool cover where it opens up and it's got like a little cutout window that shows in the background a mysterious looking person in a tower. And that, that cutout is really, really cool and it really caught the attention of folks in, in, in the UK and in English speaking countries in Europe. Mind you, the, the North American version plays to a different audience. It was more playing to the classic nature of the novel Dracula. And the publisher, you know, had long talks with me, J.D., and said, you know, this book is a lot like Dracula in the way it's not going to come right out of the starting blocks and sell a million copies. And I'll tell you right now, guys, it's probably not going to get on the bestseller list because that's all about volume in one or two weeks it's going to be a slow burn they said it's going to it's going to be around for a long time it's going to earn you a lot of royalties over a long time and so therefore we don't want any you know kind of a, a glitzy cover that's 
come and gone with fads. We want a classic cover that's going to be appealing over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And JD and I looked at ourselves and go, who are we to argue? We just wrote the book. You know, if, if it's, it's up to you to figure out because you're an equal partner in this. You know, we, you're getting 50% royalties and so are we. So I, I, I'm in it. If that's what your expertise says, let's go. So and we got 12 more covers from all over the world. And I love looking at them every day and by the poster I have and going, man, this is cool. What, what, how does that vibe get someone to buy that book in Italy or Taiwan or France or Spain or wherever it is? Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I like all the covers. I, I, there's actually three main ones when you Google the book that comes up. There's the gentleman walking up the stairs. There's the uh, the one of the castle. And then there's uh, there's the one that with the, the ladies on the front of the cover and you see her neck. Yeah. And those are the three yeah. most popular ones. And I, I like all three of them, actually. Well, well, the guy walking up the steps. Now, the story of that one is that's a, that's a paperback in the U.S. Right. So that a year after the hardcover comes out, that's the, the hardcover in North America is the lady leading back and kind of that. <laughs> but let's call it the target area for, for Count Dracula. <laughs> and then a year later, the paperback comes out. And that was supposed to look, you know, less vampiric and more of a mystery, you know, kind of like a chase, sort of appealing to fans that. Yeah, certainly Dracul is a vampire story. No question, it's the origin story of Bram Stoker writing Dracula. But they wanted it to say, okay, maybe we're not going to have you know blood on it. We're not going to have an exposed neck. We're not going to have a vulnerable female. So they just thought, okay, that now that we've marketed it one way, let's market another way, that sort of mystery side. And hey, all the power to them. The trade paperback is selling great. But I, I can't remember somebody else, some other company, excuse me, some other country got permission. You know, they just signed these agreements between publishers. Right. So that's coming out in another country as well as their first edition using that guy walking up the steps, up, up the kind of tower looking thing. Yeah. I would like I said, I like all three of those covers. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. You hit on a key word there. And it's kind of the topic of the show, I think, a little bit here. Is you said the word mystery a couple of times, and uh, and yeah, and yeah. we're going to get into the mysteries of Bram Stoker. But yeah. before we get into that, because I know there's a lot of uh, individuals there that uh, out there are listeners that want to kind of take a stab at writing, and I know you said that um, you taught physical education in sciences for over 22 years. Did you write? during that period of time because most writers you know there there are well-rounded individuals where they have lots of extra curricular activities that they're involved with you know they they gleam uh tidbits from everything that they're involved with so uh, just for our listeners when you were teaching the physical education and sciences did you write at that time or were you just dedicated for physical education and uh, sciences at that time? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a good question. The answer is I, did, I didn't do any fictional writing. Um, I wrote a heck of a lot of report cards, lesson plans, <laughs> science experiments. Um, I was also coaching uh, from the national level up to the Olympic level, so it was like yearly training plans. I did a lot of reading, you know, in, in, in my, to, to escape from that world which was very action-packed, mm -hmm. exhausting, early mornings, late nights, all the other stuff. But I, I just found my, my relief was, was reading. And so when I made that transition after 22 years of, of, of that teaching and coaching life and moved to a, you know, a, a more cerebral kind of world, decided to get into writing, yes, there was a you know, learning curve, but I, I, got, I had collaborators. I had, you know, a, both, both the books I, I wrote were with other guys who had had some writing experience, and we also had help of editors. So here, here's the advice that maybe answer your question. I, I believe my background, and, and I've always been a guy who can sit around and talk and tell stories. And you can, you, you, you can, you can tell a story, you just got to get it down on paper, and then you have to go through it over and over again to edit it, to get it 
it down to a logical way where you're not wasting too many words, you're not dribbling on, you're not boring people to death. And then, of course, if you're not trained, and my hat's off to those folks that become trained writers, you can go to editors and, and you pay them good money to edit your work to help you put it into a better sequence. In my case, I did both that as well as had a guy that I was collaborating with to say, all right, Dacre, let's, let's write this part. I'm going to do this part. You're going to do this part. And when we get this done, <laughs> this first chapter or two, if our words don't all look the same and blend together, then I'll do a pass on it to make them blend a little bit together. No problem. But what we need from you, Dacre, is a ton of research about your family, about Bram Stoker writing Dracula, about historical things that are absolutely correct, places that we're going to put in the novel. We need to have this, you know, everything done just right. So I, I played that role as well. So, you know, to, to message to your listeners is don't be scared if you haven't got a degree in English literature or something like that. You can still write. You can, you can keep a diary, you can keep a journal, you can start writing stories. And if it ever, if you think it gets good enough, just be prepared to shell out some money to have somebody to edit it, to put it into a good enough form to get it to an agent. The agent's got to then go through it sometimes, maybe get you to redo some things. Then they say, now it's good enough to get to a publisher. Or, heck, you can just self-publish right from the beginning. Right. So do you think your background, too, in... Uh, coaching and athletics really sort of gave, gave you not maybe maybe stamina is not the right word but it sort of gave you structure and discipline towards your writing did that was that helpful a a absolutely you know there's there, there's one big similarity when you go out and perform as i did as an athlete and then later as a coach you put it all on the line in front of people you're vulnerable you blow it you don't make a personal best. You don't achieve your goal of the day. Something happens. You go back to grindstone and you keep working at it. The same thing in writing. You get used to ultimate refusals from people. You know, you, you submit something. No, not good enough. Don't like it. Oh, that, was, that wasn't very good. And so that ability develops thick skin and the ability not to be dissuaded from wanting to get something accomplished, either writing or a certain time in a running race or a swimming race or something like that, it's very similar. You got, you've got to have perseverance. So you mentioned the word stamina, and close to that is perseverance and confidence to so say, you know what, darn it, if, if I can get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and swim and to do this and that, I could certainly plunk myself down in front of the computer a 14th time to get this story right, or 15th, <laughs> or something Ab like that. Absolutely. All right, Dak Dakery, when you were doing the historical research on your, your great grand uncle there, Bram Stoker, uh, I'm assuming that you came across a very a lot of interesting things. And uh, I noticed that the word mysteries of Bram Stoker has been thrown out there a lot. What What is some of the mysteries that you might could uh, reveal to our listeners? Well, okay, where do we start? Um. You know, I guess it's all relative because I don't know what the listeners don't know already. But here, I'll just go through some pretty cool things that I think are worthy of mention um, of my great grand uncle Bram. And everything starts with him being uh, born in what they call Black 47, which is a really dark time in, in Irish history when they had, just, just like now, you know, they had a cholera epidemic, mm -hmm. they had potato famine. They had people being quarantined, they had people not knowing what the heck was going on, how these diseases were were uh, passed on from person to another. So here's a here's a little kid, wasn't expected to alive, to to to, to live, and and for the first seven years of his life, he's a pretty much an invalid, lies in bed with some misdiag, you know, whatever the diagnosis was, nobody knows. Undiagnosed mysterious illness, but then he recovers at the age of seven. How does he recover? And, and nobody really knows. Now, I've got my theories and I've got my ideas that J.D. Barker and I used to, to write Track Cool, but my, my theory is it may have been something like respiratory allergies and asthma. I say that because one of his brothers had it, and it's still very prevalent in the Stoker, Stoker blood. 
Mm-hmm. It's only, I have seven kids, only, only three had children. Bram Stoker had a son, and that line is still alive. And then Bram Stoker's youngest brother, George, my great-grandfather, had a son, and he got married and had three sons, and so our family tree's going quite well. And there's still asthma in both those branches. So it's pretty strong to be in Bram, if it's the case, and somehow in his youngest brother. So that's something you do grow out of. But when I analyze the type of living situation that they were in, they, they live right on Dublin Harbor, Clontarf, moist and mildewy. The bedding that they lived on was, was, was straw beds covered with linen. They were, they were upper middle class, but they didn't have, you know, rubber mattresses in those days. So if, if it was allergies, he's sleeping on top of the stuff that's making him making him sick. That's all this mold and mildew. Right. And so when they moved inshore away from the harbor, he started getting better. And when he got better, he also started long distance walking to build up his cardiovascular system. And that's when he actually got kind of into sports and he hit his growth spurt at the, at the age of 14 and grew to be six foot two and became a champion race walker rugby player, rower, gymnast. He was he became this all around stud, so he he somehow got out of this illness. And and whatever the illness was, it didn't hurt his cardiovascular system. So that's num- that's number one as far as weird mysteries and what JD Barker and I did, we sat around up at my mountain house in North Carolina and said, you know, with all the sports I've seen, people make mysterious miraculous recoveries from Ill- illnesses and injuries. There's steroids involved, there's blood blood doping involved, there's something illegal going on. I wonder if we could use in our story some sort of supernatural intervention that helped Bram go from being an invalid to being a big stud athlete. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, maybe that's a good reason why we write our story, Dracula, like he writes his novel, Dracula, as a warning to the world that vampires are real. So that, you know, I took one of these mysteries and turn it into a what if. That's what we writers do. We like, what if this could happen? Right. This situation, a real real story, and twist it. Um, so that's that's one of the first major mysteries is, is this strange illness that comes back. And, but another piece of that, guys, is when you, and you read Dracula or Dracul, I noticed there's a lot of references to nightmares, bad dreams. And one of the easiest things you do is you go to the Gutenberg book online and, and, you, and you word search nightmares, dreams, bad dreams. You see how many times it comes up. And what I learned was Bram was very interested in the occult. Right. But it was a time when the occult was looked at negatively. And so people had to kind of move into secret societies behind closed doors to look at this kind of stuff. Now, we're not talking sacrificing a black cat on Friday the 13th, but we are talking about the Hellfire Club. We're talking about Order the Golden Dawn, a breakaway from Freemasonry. We're talking about spiritualism that, you know, people were like, what the heck happens to the spirit or the soul of the body as, as when we die? You know, this was the, like the 1800s when religion was telling us, well, you're a good man, good woman lead a good life, come to church on Sunday, you go to heaven, they'll all be rewarded. You know, some of these people are getting educated in the sciences and saying, well, I'm not buying that stuff. And they want to look more. They right. were looking into mesmerism, which was ESP. Bram used that in Dracula. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is, secretly, Bram Stoker investigated all this cool stuff. And, and I have actually found can't tell where just yet. That's another book I'm working on with another person. But correspondence between Bram Stoker and, and, and people who were experts in the occult. One of them was his professor, mm-hmm. Edward Dowden, at Trinity College. Dowden's wow. daughter was a, in those days they called them famous, not infamous, uh, medium. Today we call them paranormal experts. And she was a medium who claimed to make contact through seance with Oscar Wilde and other big noted people. And, and she was not a laughed at, you know, 
person in society. This was Professor Edward Dowden's daughter. These are all contemporaries and, and people Brad was re related to, and we've see, I've seen letters back and forth. So here's another cool mystery is, he was not just sort of a boring theatrical manager that came up with a good idea for a vampire story. He had all these interesting things that he was investigating and researching and finding what, you know, testing the temperature of potential readers and then inserting them into his novel because, you know, this was something other people were interested in. And the final thing I'll tell you before I get off of this mystery kick is, I'm so glad you asked this question. My, my favorite quote from the novel Dracula, there are mysteries which men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. And, and I memorize it because I say it a lot. But when you think of that, there are mysteries what men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. It's Bram Stoker talking about the occult, talking about mesmerism, phrenology, all this other stuff that, hey, if you have an open mind, you just may be able to figure stuff out. And if we can't figure it out now, we may get more advanced in our sciences and our technology that we may figure them out at some time. But just because we can't believe, you know, we can't understand them right now, doesn't mean they're not there. But you know what? You touched on something that Timothy and I had just discussed recently, uh, doing our own research on various topics, is that Thousands of years ago, individuals were so well versed in magic and the phenomena of magic and it seems as as we move forward in time, we've forgotten a lot of this hidden knowledge. It's there, but you know, technology has uh, replaced so many things, but there's so many books out there or manuscripts out there with hidden knowledge every religion base has had magic in it that it seems like and uh, you know my heritage is scottish so bram is irish we have a lot of celtic folklore and i know that you had mentioned that his mother and his nanny you know told him a lot of folklore and again even in my own i had family members discussing with me we'd sit around and have dinner and discussing uh premature burials uh one of my ancestors was in france and they told us a story about a, a young girl that was buried alive and then they had invented that thing where they had the bell uh the string yeah. with the bell so yeah. it seems like uh he sort of had a background you know, Celtic background will mythical things and uh, spiritual things, a lot of rich folklore that sort of gave him sort of a, a deep pot to dig in. And again, you had mentioned about bloodletting too. I mean, I mean, that was ripe for any kind of, for me, you know, just going off and creating things from all those experiences and a lot of times when you go through a traumatic illness or experience as a young child it opens you up you know once you sort of get better or you know it opens you up to a whole new world i don't know if that makes sense no no it does i mean that, 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 i'm so glad you brought that up because one of my points is everything that he went through with the illness and what he saw going on around him in this black 47, people dying in the streets and so on. And you combine that with, just as you mentioned, the stories that I know I have records of that his mom and his nanny told him, Irish folklore, very much like Scottish folklore, is rich with, you know, they're basically cautionary tales about, if you, if you like the boogeyman, basically what we say over here in North America, you know, if you do this, you don't do this, if you do this, the boogeyman's gonna get you. If you act well, you behave well, you're okay. But if you go out and do this, you're in deep trouble. You're gonna, you know, the, you're gonna turn into a vampire, the banshee's gonna get you, or the, the puka's gonna get you, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So he had all this stuff kind of, you know, deeply ingrained into this vulnerable young mind who he didn't know if he was gonna live or die or be buried prematurely or whatever. So I'm sure he was very open in a sad way, just kind of the, the sort of negative youth. And so later on, when he did recover from it, and as you say, go to the world and luckily develop confidence as, a, as an athlete and kind of build his own self-esteem, 
But it all comes around full circle when he goes and starts reading in the London Library, you know, 30 years later, about people, once again, scientifically looking at the concept of vampirism and spiritualism and mesmerism. And he goes, oh my God, maybe there's something to that. It's his own sort of traumas that he went through, and now it reconnects. And that's, that's to me, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, just bent and determined on believing this is what this perfect storm of his own life and his vulnerabilities to what he is actually researching. And that's what makes Dracula so special, is that he found this guy, Vlad the Impaler, who was known in two books they looked at as the devil. But here's that occult thing coming back again. Mm -hmm. He's reading stories that I've looked at, the same books that he looked at in the London Library, and it mentions different places, volcanoes where the devils would live, places in, in Eastern Europe, the Carpathian Mountains, has all the sort of mister mysterious stuff. And then you look into the novel Dracula and you met you see all these mentions of the devil. And and the one entry in Bram's own personal Bible that he was given at the age of eleven years old, the one entry that's underlined resisteth resisteth the devil and ye shall be free. So I think Bram realized, as many people did, these dreams this sleepwalking, this trance stuff that people would get into, that he got Lucy into in the story, that was all opportunities for the devil to take you over a, a type of possession. So I, I am sure all this jumbled in together, just as you were saying, this sort of magic, witchcraft, sorcery, occultism. This, this all had a huge impact on him. Now, now I got a couple of questions for you, and uh, one of them would be because you mentioned Bram's Bible, and I, I actually didn't have this question for you, but since you brought it up, I uh, I was curious. Do you know if he was a religious man? Did he go to church later in life? And the Bible that he had, do you know what version of the Bible that was that he was uh, reading? I believe it was a King James version. Okay. He was a practicing Protestant. He went to church, and, uh, and, and, and he, uh, he was a God-fearing man. He was brought up, obviously, in a Catholic country, primarily, where there was a lot of religious conflict in Ireland, moved to England, and, um, but I, I, I don't know how religious he was. I, I, I knew he followed a, you know, a, a religion, but I'll also tell you this. I believe he was also a man who was very open-minded. And when he started reading Walt Whitman, who had some very controversial you know, things that he wrote about, he was also a, a male nurse in the Civil War and saw incredible and horrible things, that he was, he sort of preached this idea of something called pantheism, which is accepting of all religions allowing man, man as a man in general, to say, hey, it's okay what you want to have faith in, but you, you got to have faith in something. And, and basically, every religion boils down to good versus evil. Whichever cross or symbol that you're looking at, it's, it's basically good versus evil. And, and, and I've had some chats with theologians about Dracula. And, and they say, you know, this is basically a book about good versus evil, where good wins out at the end. And when I think about this, this Mark Twain quote in the novel, that's what Brand is also saying. It's what Van Helsing is trying to explain to the scientist Seward. You've got to believe. Believe in what, he says. You've got to, you've got to believe in things you know to be untrue. Excuse me, faith is believing in things you know to be untrue. So just because you can't prove the presence of a vampire, you can't prove the presence of a god, you've still got to have faith. And you've got to have faith that the goodness will win out over evil. And I think that's maybe, Tim, the theme that you're getting at. I don't think it's, it'd be a thing to pigeonhole Bram to say he was, you know, a heavily duty practicing Church of England. 
under Church of Ireland or Protestant as much as he was a man of faith and right. was looking at the, the goodness of all human beings and humanity. Right. No, I agree with that. That's that's awesome, man. And you know what? I didn't even have that as a question until I heard you talk about his Bible. And I think uh, that was a great way that you explained it. And uh, yeah, I can appreciate that. I uh, I kind of want to talk about Daiquiri for a moment. Or, or how, all right, I call you Daiquiri, but I know I'm, I'm butchering the name there, the pronunciation. Now, how, how, how do you pronounce your name, sir? Well, you, you, you've done it like many people have done it, so that's how it's spelled, so there's no fault. But it's actually Dacre, like Dacre. an acre okay. of land with a okay. D slammed in front, which it came around in a kind of cool way because Bram Stoker's father had a brother named one of his children Dacre. And my parents met this guy, Dacre Stoker, on their honeymoon. And they said, if you ever have a son, this name is dying out in our family, you need to call him Dacre. And so this guy went on and he did some pretty amazing stuff. My parents, when they met him on their honeymoon, when they went to England, he had been an Irish submarine captain in the British Navy in World War One, And they didn't have many submarines in those days. <laughs> the Australian Navy not wanted to buy their first two submarines for the British to, to, to patrol Sydney and Melbourne. So Captain Dacre Stoker, he was actually known HHG Dacre Stoker, <laughs> had a lot of names plugged in. I guess guess he had a lot of godparents, who knows? But anyway, H H Henry Hugh Gordon Dacre Stoker was a captain of the submarine and he was actually involved in the Battle of Gallipoli, which was a horrible defeat for the for the um, Anzac forces, the Australian New Zealand forces, but he got his submarine up the Dardanelles, which is the narrow channel between Greece and Turkey, which is the same channel that the Demeter in, the, in, in, the, in Dracula went up and down to, to get from the Black Sea, obviously, to Whitby. So right. I, I, it's a long story about the name, but I came about it because it's a family-based name, and the guy was really cool, and he was a war hero, he escaped from the Turkish after the submarine was ruined. He escaped and he got captured again. And then he got back out at the end of the war, became an actor and uh, and an author. And he actually wrote a book called Straws of the Wind. Now, now, now uh, the, uh, the the question that I actually wanted to go on with, with you personally, because I said in your own right, you're establishing yourself in the horror community real strongly. And that's great. And uh, I'm hearing uh, Alexandria inform me about a comic book that's coming out. Could you explain a little bit about what's going on with the comic book? Because I, I don't even know anything about that. Well, I, I, I thank you, Alexandria, for following me on Facebook, I guess, because <laughs> yeah. it, it, no, no, this is good. I mean, that, that, that's what it's all about, is, is helping spread the word. Right. I've I decided, you know, that uh, I, I love writing novels. And, and that's, that's, you know, when I, when I find a, a collaborator that I trust and we can split the work 50-50 and we're all okay with the names and all this other business, i got more stories in me. But at the same time, I look at a lot of Bram Stoker's short stories and there's some pretty cool short stories. And there's about four of them in particular that I just absolutely love and I, and I like, I read them and, and you know, the words are a little difficult, and, and his, his, his old English is kind of difficult. And I think if I can get those stories out to a wider audience, people can appreciate Bram, story, Bram Stoker's stories more. And, and I just happened to get involved writing the afterword for Legendary Comics. Robert Mapton got a hold of me and said, we're putting out a Bram Stoker's edition of Dracula working with the Bell Lugosi estate and we're going to draw this thing and have anywhere where there's Dracula there it's going to be Bell Lugosi's face awesome. and we got really cool artists on it and it's, it's a Lugosi you know edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula and I said that sounds, sounds like a cool idea and they put me in touch with Lynn Lugosi Sparks the granddaughter and um, so we've, we've gone back and forth and chatted and we have panels I wrote the afterword, she wrote the foreword, and that got the juices flowing, like, why can't I do that to some of the other books? So, I found a, I found a guy who's in Edmonton, Alberta, an Irish guy, who's a 
who's actually a Freemason. His name is Chris McCall. He's a great guy. And and he is, is so, he's like the other collaborators I've worked with. He has a great sense of reverence for Bram Stoker. And he wouldn't feel confident. He wouldn't kind of, you know, roll over the story or dominate the story himself. He would let Bram Stoker's story come out. And then he helped me find Jessica Martin, an an actress who's also an artist in England. So you put these team of people together, and we're adapting some of Bram Stoker's short stories to become graphic novels. We've actually got a publisher in, in Andrews Publishing in the UK. And the first one we're doing, now I have not told this to anybody yet in any kind of podcast or show. So I'll tell you now, the first one we're doing is we're adapting the short story called The Squaw, which for political reasons we're ch- changing it to The Virgin, in, the Virgin's Embrace. Right. And so this, this is this is a story of Bram's, he, he wrote the story of a young British couple who go to Nuremberg, Germany, on their honeymoon. And the old city, the old part of Nuremberg, is dominated by a wonderful old castle. Kind of like Whitby is dominated by Whitby Abbey in the St. Mary's Church. And in the castle is quite a famous torture chamber. And you guys probably know this, but one of the earliest medieval sort of devices is something called the Virgin of Nuremberg, which is this tall standing uh, cylinder almost that looks a little bit like a female. And, and you open the doors mm. to it. And they put the victim in, and they got all these spikes. Oh yeah! And, when, and, and you close the guy in there, and the spikes go into you, but not so far in that you die quickly. So number one, you're enclosed, so claustrophobic. The spikes go in a slow, miserable death. It's horrifying. And I believe Bram Stoker went to Nuremberg. We don't have a record of it. We know Henry Irving went there with a group of people from the Lyceum Theater to study the castle because they were going to perform different uh, theatrical plays at the Lyceum Theater and they like to do things right and get different feels and different vibes from different castles for the set designers. And Bram wrote about Irving and the other people going, but he didn't say I went there too. He just wrote it as if Irving went and I just can't believe he wouldn't have gone. He went everywhere in Irving. He was his right-hand man. So I'm convinced that this was semi-autobiographical of Bram and Florence taking a, taking a, a vacation there. And I won't spoil it, but something weird-ass that happened with that Virgin of Nuremberg. And that is being turned into a graphic novel. The first of a series of six of them. So we're going to have some of Bram's stories and some of our own original stories that are kind of based, like I've done with Dracula and Drag the Undead, stuff that happens in Dracula, but, you know, it's off in the distance, or he did, didn't develop it very well, or stuff that might happen in the asylum, or on the Demeter, or in the monastery, or, you know, Hartra's escape that we don't know about, but we kind of knew it had to happen. That's my next big project, guys. So right there, breaking news that you just gave us is the, uh, it's going to be called The Virgin's Embrace? But, and I, I don't know, you might not know this, and I'm pretty sure you don't, but I'm a huge comic book collector, and I do have graphic novels as well. And I'll tell you that uh, when this comes out, I need a signed copy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll make it happen, man. We'll make it happen. But you know what, you were, you were touching on that, and I think I think that's a, a, a very interesting point, because we know that Bram or some people may or may not know he wrote 12 novels and then you mentioned the numerous short stories but I think you're doing such a service to your great grand uncle by exposing a whole different generation to his work by a different medium in a comic book you know there's individuals that read paperback hardcover but you're actually bringing to life a whole different generation or do different uh, marketing where people get to enjoy the genius of Bram Stoker and I think it, it's absolutely you're doing such a service 
to him by exposing the masses in different genres of telling a short story. And I, I think that's absolutely, you're, you know, you're keeping the legend alive and you're really going on a mass scale. And I think when somebody is a literary genius, uh, I, I think it's incredible that you're able to to do that and it's really like i said you're keeping his limit his uh legend alive well you know it's so nice to hear that because that's what i'm trying to do and, and when people like you get it and understand it, it it makes me feel good because you know the process is not always easy it it, it, it is a lot of work you know i i honestly and if you guys are comic book people you know to, to figure out how to what words to extract from a, a short story and, and to include them into only into a 22 page graphic novel where you got either four or five panels and you've got a you know, luckily Chris and, and Jessica are like right there by my side it's not easy to convey the story from short story prose into that visual medium but it's a great experience and again it's like we talked about at the top of the show you know i've developed this kind of sense of confidence to go ahead and try it put myself in a team atmosphere where it's folks around me know what they're doing so i'm not doing this blindly because i want to do Bram stoker a service i don't want to do a lousy job I, I feel they got a lot of responsibility to make sure in whatever way this goes out if it's a if it's another short story or if it's a novel or if it's a graphic novel or even you know as you guys both know graphic novels are like good storyboards to create short film if it goes that direction that would be great too but i, I don't want to do a, a lousy job and bring bram's name down i need to i need to elevate it i think it's going to be great man i'm excited as a comic book collector and i've been a comic comic book collector for decades I had, when the Vlad comic books came out, I had the whole collection. I never even opened them. Uh, I kept them in mint condition because I was afraid to open them. But, I mean, I had one that I would open and read, but the rest of them I kept in mint condition. But, uh, yeah, so I'm really excited about this one. It sounds like it's going to be a real, really good project. And I know in a lot of uh, uh, things and a lot of research in your writings, too, uh, you've had tours and you've had several visits to Romania and not to put you on the spot Do you think you could describe Romania in one word? Okay, hold on a sec. Let me think about that one word <laughs> Yes <laughs> um, It's uh, Contrast Oh, that's 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 a good definition. That's a good sort okay. of visual. I mean, that, that, I mean, it's really hard. If, if you if if I could squeak a couple out, I'd say it's a country of contrast. Right. And, and now I have to elaborate because if I didn't, it would be bad. And, and I don't want to because you've got you know, you know if, and I've been there now ten times, and I'm going to tell you about the little trailer that I just done because I'm working on a documentary over there. But it really is. It 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 was a. Um, you know, it's, it's gone through an awful lot from, you know, 30 some odd years of communism to coming out of that. And now they're trying to catch up to, you know, the, and become a first world country. So you've got that transition, the mindset of a lot of the elderly people who were kind of stuck in the, in that communistic way of just do the bare minimum you know, bureaucratic stuff. But then you've got young people who are incredibly creative and energetic and, you know, want to travel and want to welcome people to their country and show people that this is a country that is unspoiled in about, you know, 80% of the country is this beautiful countryside, mountainous country great biodiversity, incredible stands of virgin forest, wonderful Danube Delta, sort of like the Florida Everglades in North America, but sort of a freshwater version of the Black Sea. But at the same time, cities that are vibrant, but they're crowded and there's, you know, air pollution and a lot of traffic and inefficiencies. And then within half an hour to an hour, you're in places where I, I, 
I don't, I'm not kidding you, you think you're back in the 1600s. So that's what I mean by the contrast between city and country. You've got incredibly well preserved medieval cities, walled cities where people have, are living inside with washers and dryers and satellite dishes, you know, inside things that are built in the 1700s. And I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really kind of cool. It's a friendly place. They, they, they love North American travelers. It's inexpensive. And this massive mountain range, the Carpathians, are really interesting because, you know, they don't have great roads, you know, no, no super highways. It takes a while to twist and turn your way up. You've got to be patient. The scenery, you could, you could be in Switzerland. Some of the stuff is, is so beautiful. And castles. You know, for, for whatever reason, they're very, very well preserved. And uh, a lot of really cool castles and great history. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I've had a good time leading some tours over there. And right now I'm filming a documentary on the search for why Bram Stoker put his, his story there and why why we've just now found this, lo this location of this fictional castle Dracula. Now, now, going back to there, uh, I know that there's a map that I discovered that you were selling. I think, I don't know if it's you selling, but it's, a, it's, it's attached to you online for $40. It's a, it's a map of Transylvania. Oh, yeah, it's the, it's the Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, yes, that is a map that I actually found in one of the, well, not the book. I found the map. Okay, back up, Dinker. In the London Library a year and a half ago, the guy running the place discovered all the books that Bram Stoker used for his research. He asked me to come over to verify all the marks and the margins. Mar Bram actually had a pencil in kind of a naughty way. He marked up the books as he was researching it for Dracula. We know that to be a fact because his son actually donated two books of Bram's to the London Library after Bram died, and they had the exact same markings in them. I went over to help verify that because I do have a few things I inherited from Bram's family and they had the same markings. So when I got this list of these books, I saw the books and some of them had these maps in the back. You unfolded them. I quickly went online and went to Abe Books or eBay and I bought the exact same editions of these books so I could have my own collection of these books so I could read them at my leisure and also open up and unfold the maps. So that's why I say it's not the exact map, but it's the exact same map from a similar edition book that Bram had, and I had it reproduced. And it is one of three maps that Bram actually had access to. And this one is the only one of the three it actually has the name Borgo Pass written on it in exactly the right place where Bram set the story. And very close to that is a series of rivers and a mountain called Mount Israel. And when Hans de Roos, a Dutch scholar, was looking at Bram's notes in the Rosenbach Museum, he noticed in the top right-hand corner of one of the pages, a pencil, was written these same rivers that, that was on this map and Mount Israel. And furthermore, it also mentioned two lines of longitude and latitude. So when Hans put those two lines on, and, and on a map, he figured out that their convergence point was somewhere in the Southern Arabian Desert. He called me up all, all irritated. And he goes, well, this, this, this doesn't make sense. The lines of longitude and latitude converge in somewhere in the Saudi Arabia desert. Nothing to do with Transylvania. And we both discussed the fact that Bram liked to hide things and ciphers and stuff like that. So Hans decided to invert the lines of longitude and latitude. What he did, they lined up right near the Borgo Pass, right near this Mount Israel, right near the river Bistritza and Sarah that were listed in the, on the map and the notes. So it's like this aha moment for Jerus that he gives me this information. This has got to be the location. And then we start looking at the novel and see that right there in the last two chapters of the book, when all the band of heroes have traveled across Europe in the, in, in the uh, Orient Express and ended up in Varna waiting for the count ship, but he tricks them and he 
he takes the ship to Galat instead, he gets a head start and heads up the eastern part of the country on these same rivers in a steamship or a boat, small boat. So the band of heroes chase up the side of the country, two of them in a ship, two of them on a train, and two of them on carriages to try to intercept the camp. Where do they intercept them? At the convergence of the River Ceres and Pastriza, exactly at these lines of longitude and latitude, right at the base of this mountain, Mount Israel. Wow. So <laughs> I, I had to go there and check it out myself. That was one of my trips. I went with my son, and uh, we actually had a tour, people. Once the tour was over, since I hadn't been here, I didn't want to take tourists on a place that I have no idea where the heck it is or what it's going to look like. But I, so when it was over, they all went home. And my son and I continued. We hired a guy, and we uh, had a couple other friends who were remaining guys, some other outdoor adventurers. And we conver converted the lines of longitude and latitude to GPS, and we ended up getting up here. And it was, it was pretty cool. And, and long story short, went back a year and a half later with the blessing of the national park that this area is actually in. And we had a big press conference, and my buddies over there, I designed a plaque they had it made. And the folks over there have uh, pledged to, to mark a trail so people like me don't have to bushwhack in. We get a trail where you can walk <laughs> in and, and actually see this place where this convergent point was in the novel where the good guys had that fight with Dracula and stabbed him in the chest. And, and, and of course, there is no castle there because it's a fictional castle. Exactly. You know, it's, just, it's a location. What we do know is Brand Castle in the city, near the city of Brasov, is the castle that Bram Stoker saw in two of these books I've just been talking about in the London Library. And he used those sketches from these books to describe the look of Bram Castle. But now we know that he placed it 400 miles to the north, right near the Morco Pass. And, and these maps right here that we're referring to, because uh, you said people can purchase them on Kickstarter, and what, what does that go towards? Yeah. What, it's all part of something called Unearthed Bram Stoker Rare Papers. So, with all my traveling around the world for the last 15 years, going to all these different museums, archives, universities, private collections, I get lucky and I get privileged to see all these incredible Bram Stoker notes for Dracula, the typescript for Dracula, different letters, postcards, all these different things that are in different places of the world, that when you bring them together, you get to see a lot of the stuff that went into Bram Stoker writing Dracula. So it's all his early, you know, it's his life, it's rare papers, it's his maps, letters from his mother telling him what a wonderful job he did writing Dracula, all this cool stuff. And the, the Kickstarter basically starts at a, the lowest level is a $40 map, and it goes all the way up to, I think, $500 with these different, they're replica papers. All these papers I mentioned. Now, these aren't just run through a photocopy machine. This guy, Vic Nadata, of Gemini, Gemini Artifacts, what was, was a guy that's worked for um, theater and new movie prop company where they make things that look and feel exactly like the real thing. So when they're on screen, they look the same way. So he's, he has like an eight step aging process to reproduce stuff just like this. So these things, it's very, very hard to tell the difference between the original docs and, and the real and, and, our, and our replicas. But the good thing is that they're not priceless. You know, they, they, they may cost you somewhere between 40 bucks and, and $500 if you, if you buy all of them, I mean, there's a couple hundred papers, and he's also offering, Vic has, has done a reproduction of the first U.S. edition of Dracula, which is, it's amazing. He's got the thing looking exactly the same way with this kind of modeled uh, way the paper picks up, you know, coloration and staining through the years. I guess it's some kinds of fungus or something, bacteria or stuff that grows on the pages after 100 years. Now, now, you mentioned something also about it, and that, that sounds awesome, man. I'm, I will put the link to the Kickstarter in the description if you approve of that. 
And uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. It, it's only active. Unfortunately, the the thing closes on Halloween, so I don't know when the show is going to air. But uh, uh, put, you know, put the link in. But if it's if it's after Halloween, then it's gone. <laughs> Okay, yeah, because it's either going to go up today or in the morning, so... Uh, well, that, no, that's, that's fine. I mean, we've already funded, so it's 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 happening. We'd like to sell more, but yeah, if it's going up today or tomorrow, then yeah, put it on there. It's just, uh, maybe when I get done, um, I can shoot you an email with the actual link that takes you right to the page if that helps. That'd be, gr that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Alexandria, send you her, uh, the, the email address. Um... But you did mention something about a film or documentary you're involved in as well. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so what I just described in, in four or five minutes, we turned into a 30-minute documentary. Is is deciphering the notes, uh, the search for the fictional Castle Dracula. And that's it is done. It actually premiered in Brasov, Romania, 10 days ago. Wow. It's episode episode one of what will become, hopefully, if we get funding, a six episode series about Bram Stoker writing Dracula. My search for the truth. So we've already done we've already filmed the one with finding the fictional Castle Dracula. We have plans to do the same thing. Why Bram Stoker went to the town of Whitby in, in Yorkshire in England and why he chose to put chapter six, seven, and eight there, all the things that he based the true story, uh, it, the truth of Whitney and the wreck of the Demeter and the Whitney Abbey, St. Mary's Church, it, it's all real places, real people, real things, and Bram fictionalized it. We do the same thing in Ireland, as, as uh, Alexander and I taught, talked about at the beginning, why Bram had these stories in his mind, all his upbringing, places that he did his research. We go to the London Library to look at all those books I was telling you about and open them up and looking at the markings. We go to Cruden Bay, Scotland, where Bram actually did the writing of the novel on his holidays. He did his research in Whitby, the London Library, but he actually had time in London to write it. So we take it, we take the action up to Cruden Bay, Scotland, where incidentally, we actually found, or I did, Mike Shepard, who is the guy that good friend of mine now, he wrote a book called When Brave Men Shudder, all about Bram Stoker's 13 summer holidays in Cruden Bay. He found that a castle there, the one castle there, now that it doesn't have a roof on it, it's a ruin, and drone went up over top, looked down, and it found the octagonal room that Bram Stoker described in Chapter 2 of Dracula. Wow. So he, he uses... The exact same floor plan in Chapter 2. And Jonathan Harker walks in and the Count brings him in, goes into an internal room, octangular room, no no windows to the outside, lit by a single lamp. I've been in that room. And when I gave a lecture at the Kilmonic Arms Hotel, the same hotel Bram stayed in, a man stood up and said, I'm a, I'm a relative of that family that used to own that castle. We still have the single lamp. We still have the lamp. Wow, that's amazing. So, so yeah, so that, that's the kind, this is the documentary on all these cool backstories that are going into Bram Stoker writing Dracula, his motivation, his inspiration, his research in the real places that he did it. Well, you know what, most people, and your you're hope, you're, you're going to change this with the uh, short stories and all this, but, you know, anybody you mention the name Bram Stoker, they think of Dracula, and that's what he's best known for. But as we spoke about earlier, do you really think because the Dracula story is a battle of good and evil, do you think that that's what people relate to? Yes, it's horror, but it has throughout the novel the continual battle of good and evil. And I think a lot of people are always looking for hope. Uh, you know, they kind of relate their own uh, tribulations, trials, and tribulations in their own life and a novel like this if you really go behind the scenes ultimately it is a, a battle of good and evil do you think that's why it's at the moment one of the best known works wow you know that I mean I, I think so uh, Alexandria I, I think that's the, the central theme but 
at the same time, you know, when, when I look at the different things that people who create movies and have for hundred years, you know, really since 1922, it's almost, you know, hundred years since Nosferatu came out. And, and then every different inspiration and motivation um, that has been spurned by Dracula on stage, on screen, big screen, little screen, all that. I think probably, you know, there's a few themes that tend to rise above the others. And, and one of them really is, is, is good wins out. You know, that, that thing that's probably the most barometer. But close to that, you know, there is this idea of, you know, the blood exchange, the sexuality, you know, that that's that's kind of a, you know, like a sub-theme. But a lot of times that rises above the others when these guys who make these movies and stage plays want to sell a lot of tickets and they know that, you know, sex sells. So that becomes a bigger part of it. And somebody else also likes the violence, you know, and violence and action and, you know, blood splatter everywhere and ripping heads off, that becomes predominant. And so even though you and I and, and many people that you know recognize the literary merits and the more subtle merits of good and evil prevailing as a central theme, we, we just got to realize <laughs> you know, in a way that to, to sell tickets and make money, it's okay for these guys to deviate and you know, show some cleavage and show some blood every now and then. Yeah. That's, that's, that's it, you know, that, that's part of it, no question. You know what, and here's the thing, man, I've made three independent horror films myself, and I always had to defend the sex part of the filmmaking, and people say, well, why did you have to put that in there? And I said, because I wanted to make money. <laughs> exactly, yeah, so, man. So, so, and, and, you know, Brent did the same thing. There's, there's no question that those scenes when, you know, he's describing... The three women in white, you know, seducing Jonathan Harker to drink his blood. That's a sex scene. It's just it's toned down because of the time. The scene with Lucy, you know, up on on, um, on St. Mary's Churchyard, you know, where Nina is, is forced to drink the blood from the count. You know, he rips open his chest. That's a sex scene in the Victorian era, as hot as you can imagine. You know, something that a true blood is nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it and you're right, and you need it if you like. You say some people appeal to that, and some people like the violence part of it. So it's all about you. You know, you want to put aspects in there where you can reach the masses, and as many aspects as you can put in there to reach the different people, the more money you're going to make. So, and, and that's what we're trying to do. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you got to pay the mortgage, don't we? <laughs> yeah. But I do have a question for you before we wrap it up. Um, we'll get ready to wind down here. But because uh, you brought up Nosferatu, and all right, I've Googled Nosferatu. We put it up on a different channel for free for people to see. And uh, what I don't know if it was uh, Bram's wife that sued the company or the state that sued the company. Somebody sued the company and had the film shut down. Do you know anything about that? Oh yeah, I, I, I do. It's an interesting sort of chapter in in the life of people who write books and get information right and wrong. Um, I've been to the British Museum and seen the letters back and forth between Brand's Widow, the British Writers Guild, or British Writers Association, something like that, and the lawyer in Germany. Um, so here, here's the deal. First of all, there's no record of Prana Films ever going to the Stoker Estate because there wasn't a state, an estate at the time. It was Charlotte Stoker. Okay, excuse me. It, it, it was Florence Stoker. Charlotte was the mom. So, Brandt dies in 1912. Florence is left with not a whole lot of money. She, she was doing okay. But, she actually made a fair amount of money on the sale of all, all Bram's books, a lot of Bram's books and things, the notes included. And then she got smart and had Hamilton Dean, an Irish guy, adapt Dracula to the stage. And then that was a big success in England, and then it got a bigger success when John Balderson came along and adapted it further to U.S. Mel Lugosi stars on stage, and 
you know, that that's she made a lot of money out of that. And when the film rights were sold, good chunk of money. So it took a little while. That wasn't until about 1924 or 25 when she got a, a good money, amount of money to live on. Until then, she was hurting a little bit. And when somehow she found out that Nosferatu, they didn't come and ask her for would you sell the rights. They just did it. And somehow she found out it happened. So she went to the, the same guild that Bram Stoker was a member of for many years and said, look, this is my husband's book that has just had a major copyright infringement. What are you going to do about it? And at first they didn't want to do anything about it because her, the husband was dead, the guy that wrote the book and paid his dues to the British Writers Guild. So she argued with them and she was very persistent and she got them to take on this case but they had to pay for a, a, a lawyer in Berlin for two and a half years, which was not cheap. But they finally won the case that this was no question a copyright infringement. And when the German courts ruled in favor of the British Writers Guild on behalf of Mrs. Stoker, Prana Films, who had made this wonderful film, said, oh, sorry, we can't, we can't pay a settlement. We're bankrupt. So the court said, then you're going to have to destroy the film. So apparently they delivered a certain number of these film canisters to the court system who destroyed them, but not all of them. Somehow a couple of them snuck out. And that's, and, I'm, I'm glad they did. <laughs> yeah, and, no, and, and, and I am too. In a way, it, it's an interesting, and I'll just wrap up with this, because it's important, and, and you and I, as we talk on this, on this podcast, are artists in our own way, and we wouldn't want somebody ripping off our stuff because that was the first copyright book to movie infringement on record. And Mrs. Stoker won, so it set a precedent. And in a way, it's good that it survived because it's a hell of a good film, and it shows us what German film, which was very advanced at the time, what they could do. It was great that it survived, but it's also great that she set precedent and prevailed. And at the end of the day, in, in not too many more years, she did just fine financially with the sale of the dramatic rights of the story. And in a good way, Nosferatu is a, a way to look at an adaptation of the story, silent film. People do great stuff with it. They put it to a great, great music scores. It's been remastered. And the one final thing I'm going to say, God, I don't know if you do this, Tim, but when I'm working on this documentary, you're allowed to use footage from from Nosferatu because it is in public domain, so you can use this footage without having to pay Prana Films oh, yeah. for royalties to use it. So it's a good happy ending, but that's that's the, that's the story as I know it. Yeah, and I wish they would have paid her because that was the right thing to do for them to actually pay her the money, and uh, the film could have even did better than what it did do. But uh. That's right, and I just wanted to, to our listeners out there too, is the Bram Stoker bobblehead still available? Because I know I, I've seen those, and those are really, really well done. Thank you. That that was a, a brainchild of myself and a, and a buddy called Anthony Taylor, and they are still available. I, I've got, I think, about 50 of them left. Um, we had them made. They are very well done. It took a long time to get it just right. Uh, you can get them on, on, on our website, which is www.bramstokerestate.com. We've got them on sale through uh, early November. I think they're at, I think, $22.45. All right, here's what I'm going to do. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. let me tell you something. She's been showing me okay. this bobblehead, man, way before she said that we're going to have you on the show. And she's been saying, here's the bobblehead. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buy one. And uh, uh -huh. so so okay. I'm going to do that right uh -huh. after the show so she can have her bobblehead of Bram Stoker. Well, I, I, I found a way. I got a special pen that I can sign the back side of the stand of it. So if you'd like me to sign it for you, I'll be glad to do that. It comes with a certificate of authenticity from the estate because it is actually licensed from, from Bram's great-grandsons who are the estate. Yeah, so, uh, she, you know, we'll, we'll arrange to get that to you. She's shaking her head yes, and we definitely want it signed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the shameless plug, and thank you for the 
sale. I appreciate it. Ah uh, man, she. I'm gonna order it right after the show. If you just tell, if you tell the listeners how to order it right now, that's the same way I'm gonna do it. And then when it comes in, we'll uh, show it on a future show here. And then we'll also yeah, put. We'll put uh, my- on the link too we'll put it in the description how they can order and they can grab it up before they're all gone because i'm just glad that i'm able to get one that that's just uh i'm gonna have that in a in a little showcase there because i've been looking at them since you've been putting them on facebook <laughs> trust me oh good well we, we've got we uh, my wife and i run this bram stoker estate.com website where we got lots of information about the family about bram really cool stuff but at the same time, we also run this little store uh, called the Signature Store. So you go to BramStokerEstate.com, go to the Signature Store in there, and it's a real simple, basic little shop. Where, but but I've got I've got the, the bobbleheads. I've actually created these really cool ties because I love old Dracula covers of books, and I've turned them into a, a, a necktie. So those are on there, and then I also have all my books that that I sell and sign. And then it's a self-explanatory. Hit the button, and then uh, it tells you to pay, and include. And the shipping is worked out. And then I pack them up myself, and I send them out um, out of here. That's that's awesome. I I look forward to uh, having mine. And once I get mine, I'm going to be plastering it all over the place. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we'll definitely do that. Actually, if uh, you, so, you got the link where we can buy. Right? She's shaking her head. Yeah. All right, so yeah, we're definitely going to buy it uh, when we get off the show. Is there anything we left out of the show here that you want to say before we wrap it up? Oh, wow, we covered a lot, and, and I think uh, I, I think we I think we've got it all done. But let me just say this: I hope everybody out there realizes that Halloween uh, to be safe during Halloween, but also Halloween originated in Ireland three thousand years ago, and and it is it is a a festival as 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 we all know it started with when when the summer is over and the daylight is is winding down and the darkness begins to take over and as they say this is the when the veil between the light and the dark the living and the dead is very very thin it's a time when not only evil spirits come out and have full sway but also the good spirits so it's a good time to think of your dearly beloved friends that have passed so think of the spiritual world around Halloween. You know, the the costumes people wear are to scare away the bad ones, uh, but also to embrace the good ones. So, you know, think of Ireland, think of Bram Stoker, think of his early childhood beginning, and think of Halloween and have a safe time and everybody stay healthy in this crazy pandemic and hopefully we can all get back together and enjoy our company when it's all over. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, you've got great things ahead. And we'll put all that stuff in the links in the description. And we appreciate you taking time for us. Thanks, uh, thanks guys. Really the, appreciate your time. Great questions. Great chatting with you as always. Hey, okay. Da- thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, Take uh, care and happy Halloween. Much. Happy Halloween. Thank you. All right. Take all care right. now. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Okay. That was Daker Stoker. Uh, so, yeah. Pretty good interview there for the first one on the new platform here. Again, we're taking a risk, but life's all about risk. We cho- we chose to take this show off the other YouTube channel and put it on this one. So this is the first show on the new channel. Hopefully, we can recover a lot of our listeners from the other channel onto this one, which I think we will, and we'll probably even do even better than on the other channel. And I think it's great because we're going to be able to streamline and have guests on it and uh, dedicate it to uh, our just the show, just our shows. Take care and happy Halloween, guys. That's it. Bye.